This is Praveen Gode. I am a professor of pediatrics at the Medical College of Wisconsin, and I will be talking today about gastroesophageal reflux in premature infants. These are my disclosures. I am a member of a DSMB at Shire Pharmaceuticals, and almost all of the medications discussed in this talk are off label. My objectives today are to in preterm infants, identify causes and associations of GER or gastroesophageal reflux, to summarize the investigations for GER, and to plan a treatment strategy for GER. Firstly, what is the difference between GER and GERD? Physiological gastroesophageal reflux is a developmental process that resolves with maturation. It involves only regurgitation and requires no evaluation or intervention and typically resolves by the first year of life. Gastroesophageal reflux disease or GERD is gastroesophageal reflux that is associated with morbidity. What are the possible morbidities in preterm infants? Frequent vomiting, aspiration pneumonia, irritability, poor growth, and worsening respiratory symptoms, including chronic lung disease. However, it is important to remember that in most infants with these symptoms, gastroesophageal reflux is not the underlying cause. GER is common in healthy infants, occurring more than 30 times per day. It is even more common in healthy preterm infants and is usually multifactorial in origin due to the immaturity of factors that normally impede gastroesophageal reflux. The most important mechanism of gastroesophageal reflux is the TLESR or the transient lower esophageal sphincter relaxation. This is usually an abrupt decrease in lower esophageal sphincter pressure unrelated to swallowing that drops this, this pressure below the pressure of the stomach. TLESR in preterms with and without GERD have the same frequency. However, acid regurgitation during these relaxation events is increased in infants with GERD. What about gastrointestinal motility? Gastric emptying. With regard to gastric emptying, preterms have slower gastric emptying, which may provide more liquid in the stomach to reflux. Also, esophageal motility may be immature in preterm infants. However, there are no data correlating either issue with symptomatic gastroesophageal reflux. Other concerns include that gastroesophageal reflux may occur more frequently in infants who have respiratory disorders. These infants typically have increased work of breathing and a relative increase of intra-abdominal pressure versus the intrathoracic pressure leading to fluid coming up into the esophagus. Also, nasogastric or orogastric tubes that traverse the lower esophageal sphincter may increase gastroesophageal reflux by either causing greater lower esophageal sphincter relaxation and or decreased gastric empty. Again, going through all of those nonspecific signs and symptoms that are suggestive of gastroesophageal reflux or gastroesophageal reflux disease. Irritability, posturing, grimacing, frequent vomiting, worsening of lung disease, and poor weight gain. However, as I said before, gastroesophageal reflux is frequently not the underlying cause. A frequent concern is that gastroesophageal reflux is associated with apnea. However, gastroesophageal reflux is not a common trigger for pathological apnea of prematurity. It is important to remember that in selected cases, a causal relationship may exist. A few studies suggest that apnea may lead to gastroesophageal reflux. However, there are no large studies that suggest that gastroesophageal reflux leads to apnea except in select circumstances. Another common concern with gastroesophageal reflux is feeding problems. GER is common in infants with poor weight gain. 
However, there is no evidence of a causal relationship in that the reflux is causing the poor weight gain. Some infants with reflux do have feeding problems, such as feeding resistance and food aversion. Arching irritability and oral feeding aversion are usually attributed to reflux. However, they tend not to be temporally associated with documented reflux events. How does one diagnose gastroesophageal reflux? It is very challenging and requires a high degree of clinical suspicion. However, invasive testing is not usually indicated. The best way to diagnose gastroesophageal reflux or reflux disease is by using a pH probe with multiple intraluminal impedance or an impedance probe. Safety concerns exist in little babies because of the fact that it is a fairly large French tube that has to traverse the nose and can block um, these obligate nose breathers from breathing. In addition, these babies need to be transported to obtain x-rays. It is also difficult to interpret results in neonates because these babies are frequently fed and this can increase the pH in the stomach. This kind of testing does document gastroesophageal reflux but rarely establishes causality between gastroesophageal reflux and gastroesophageal reflux disease. Inaccurate tests that should not be used to diagnose gastroesophageal reflux include the upper GI study and the milk scan or the technetium scintigraphy scan. Another way that gastroesophageal reflux disease is frequently diagnosed is by an empiric trial of acid suppression. However, this is rarely definitive due to the non-specific nature of the symptoms. Also, gastroesophageal reflux tends to decrease as the infant matures, making a trial less likely to be certain. Treatment is hampered by the lack of well-studied therapies. There are no good trials and also, as I mentioned before, there is an improvement in gastroesophageal reflux with maturation of the infant. What about positioning for gastroesophageal reflux? Supine positioning is recommended practically for all infants. Elevation of the head does not decrease reflux in term infants. It is however unclear if right versus left lateral positioning changes the frequency of reflux. Frequently, feeding strategies are used to try and mitigate reflux. If reflux results from increased intragastric pressure, then more frequent smaller volume feeds should decrease the number of GER episodes. What has been found is that feeding hourly versus feeding every two to three hourly does decrease reflux episodes, but can increase the number of episodes of acidic reflux. Longer feeding duration and slower milk flow rates can decrease reflux episodes. However, these can interfere with the nutrient composition of expressed human milk. Thicken feeds are frequently another strategy to deal with gastroesophageal reflux. A systematic review of RCTs of thickened formulas in term infants with reflux showed that it decreased episodes of regurgitation but did not decrease acidic reflux. Similarly, a trial of starch thickened preterm formula showed no change in the total number of GER episodes, but total lower esophageal acid exposure was decreased. Hence, these may show some benefits, but not all of those that we would want to see. There are definitely concerns with thickened feeds, especially in preterm infants. Xanthan gum has been associated with late onset necrotizing enterocolitis and therefore is not recommended for use in preterms or former preterms in the first year of life. Formulas that thicken on acidification in the stomach are appropriate for term babies but are not nutritionally appropriate for preterm infants. 
when feeds are thickened with infant cereal they can change the osmolality of the formula and they may also be difficult for infants with weak oromotor skills to consume extensively hydrolyzed formula and elemental formula have been tried both in term infants and preterm infants in term infants they decrease the symptoms with symptomatic ger this is likely because of an overlap of manifestations with cow's milk protein allergy and gastroesophageal reflux in small studies of preterm infants extensively hydrolyzed formulas decreased reflux episodes but there was no change in behavioral signs of gastroesophageal reflux how do we treat gastroesophageal reflux the first is conservative treatment parental education is important in teaching them that reflux is often self limited and does not harm the baby many of the symptoms that are attributed to reflux are not due to reflux the most important dietary change to consider is the use of extensively hydrolyzed formula or elemental formula in formula fed infants pharmacological therapy should be reserved for those that fail conservative management and where symptoms and test results are strongly suspicious for gerd the therapy that is usually used is acid suppression and prokinetics are typically not recommended what about acid suppression in infants the refluxate is only weakly acidic and therefore acid suppressant medica medications have low efficacy in treating symptoms attributed to reflux randomized control trials have shown no advantage of ppis versus placebo in treating symptoms attributed to reflux hence acid suppression has a limited role in infants with reflux it has no effect on non acid reflux and there is limited evidence of benefits with concerns about potential adverse effects as mentioned several times before gastroesophageal reflux typically decreases as the infant matures it should not be used in children with uncomplicated reflux and solely to treat apnea or episodes of oxygen desaturation in preterm infants one way to consider acid suppression is using this algorithm carefully select infants with gerd once there is a failure of non pharmacological measures try a one week trial of acid suppression if there is no response the medication should be stopped if there is a positive response continue the medication and reassess in 2 to 3 weeks with this we reach our conclusions Our conclusions are that gastroesophageal reflux is common in preterms. Most have no complications and do not need evaluation or intervention. Many symptoms are attributed to GERD. It is likely that in many cases reflux is not the underlying cause. The diagnosis of GERD is challenging in preterms, and treatment should only be used in infants with significant morbidity. First, try non-pharmacological measures and then a limited trial of acid suppression may be warranted thank you this video was provided to you by aspen and supported by an educational grant from reckett mead johnson this five part video series on the nutrition requirements and feeding issues for the preterm infant will be available on the Aspen website at nutritioncare.org forward slash neonatal care resources.